<laughs> so hello everybody. I think we will start um, with our conversation within the next uh, minute. So warm welcome. Warm welcome to today's audience of the first two conversations dedicated to the new sector digital. My name is Nina Röhrs and I'm the curator of the new sector. And this talk will be about art in the digital age. And that already says a lot also about the new sector, which is also about art and photography in the digital age. And now some of you might wonder why art in the digital age and not digital art. Well, because there is no such thing as a uniform type of digital art in today's world. The digital offers artists both new topics, but also new media to create in new ways. And we all live in an increasingly digital world and the boundaries between the physical and the digital are constantly being blurred. And we can see the same happening in the arts. And not just today, but since the first computer systems became available in the middle of the 21st as of the 20th century. I'm proud to welcome three great my creative minds who work at the intersection of art and technology and digitalization for this panel con discussion about art in the digital age. Much admired artist Luisa Clement to my left, presented by German... <laughs> 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 Presented by German gallery Kunst und Denker Contemporary in the new sector Digital with a solo at this year's Paris Photo. Um, equally admired artist David Horwitz. <laughs> Presented by French gallery Jean Quentin Gautier based in Paris in the new sector Digital also with a solo at this year's Paris Photo. And then Marco Di Mutis, digital curator at Photo Museum Winterthur in Switzerland. <laughs> Not most admired, but a long <laughs> but a long-term companion in the endeavor to establish the digital in the canyon canon of contemporary art and photography, a dear friend. So, may I kindly ask you to briefly introduce yourself before we delve deeper into our discussion? So, I think, Luisa, you can start. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm Luisa Clement. Um, I'm working with photography, or most of the time with photography, also sculptures and video as installations, um, always dealing with the with our reality in the digital life and in the real world and trying to figure out where's the border between or is or even if there's still a border at the end. David? Uh, I'm, I'm David, came from Los Angeles two days ago. Um, I'm a Hapa. You have to, you have to Google that. Um, yeah, I make a, like... I make f photographs, think about photography. My work deals with sound, text. It's kind of like all over the place in a kind of like ADD mess. Um, thinking about a lot of things and which we will talk about some of them in a few moments. Um, yeah. Hi. So Marco, I work as digital curator at um, Photo Museum Winterthur, which is a photography museum in Switzerland. Um, my research interest is the transformation of photography in digital and network forms. And within the rest of the curatorial team uh, at the museum, we've been investigating the different forms in which these digital network images kind of affect the medium in their contemporary forms and also uh, in the past uh, yeah, three, four decades. Thank you, everybody. Um... As the first art fair in Europe, Paris Photo has decided to dedicate a whole sector to the digital. And I cannot imagine a more applicable environment for this than the world leading art fair photography. And in our daily lives, we all experience the many effects of increasing digitalization through images. And I think that's one of the main reasons why we are here today and that we can say that Paris Photo is the first fair to establish a sector 
dedicated to the digital, in a way also dedicated to the digital image above all. Um, and the production of these images is closely linked to photography and the many ways in which they are created, modified, and distributed. Marco, both in your curatorial and academic career, you are circling around the changes the image is under, has undergone in the past decades. Uh, do you mind giving us a quick overview on this? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> what follows is an hour lecture about the developer. <laughs> no, um, okay, so basically, of course, this is a very complex uh, thing to explore. Uh, one thing that I think it's important for us as for the museum is also um, thinking through photography and route in this transformation within the image rather than thinking in terms of digital art, also following up on what you said, these very broad terms, or even digital age, you know, these things that tend to end up saying a bit of nothing. Um, when we think about digital images and network images, we can think in, I try to oversimplify it here for the sake of time, but um, three, four, let's say, let's, let's use four major categories that expand over time. So if we think in the 90s is where photography institutions and uh, um, photographers deal maybe for the, for the first time at the mass level with this uh, crisis of the real. So we think of the term post-photography comes, uh, you know, already in late 80s, 90s batch, and, uh, which comes back, of course, it's a post-photography is a term that somehow is used very broadly to think about images that look like photographs, but technically they're not. Um, that's already too much for somebody to take. Let's see how we get to the, to the 2020s. So 90s, post-photography, manipulation, uh, Photoshop. Uh, this is a moment, the first kind of like crisis within the photography world. Um, fast forward another decade in the 2000s, we start seeing the rise of web 2.0. So network images, circulation of images, um, Flickr and of course then Facebook and all these other platforms in which the image is no longer stable but travels around um, the globe through different servers and networks. Um, 2010s we see the rise of what Trevor Paglen called uh, um, seeing machines, right? So network images is a term for example used by Katrina Sluis and Daniel Rubinstein, also the poor image of Tito Steyl. Then 2010s machines start to see, machine vision is being de developed, um, photographic images are also seen and produced by computers, so there's like algorithmic forms of image making, uh, which leads to contemporary forms of what we could call synthetic imaging. I'm sure that uh, other panels will explore this also more in depth, uh, these current ideas about machine learning towards uh, um, predictive image generations like artificial intelligence platforms and, and so on. So this is, this is the mini lecture. <laughs> Super good. I think we learned a lot. And um, Marco mentioned synthetic photography. The panel after this, also dedicated to the new sector, will talk about conceptual photography and synthetic photography in the age of AI. So for all of you who are interested to get a deep dive into that topic. I think we can all agree that the digitalization and all the developments that come along with it are creating an environment in which reality or what is real or what is not real is a central issue. And one aspect that is closely related to this is the fact that in today's increasingly digital world, reality is a term that applies equally to the physical and the digital world. I think like, let's say 20, 30 years ago, one might have that we live either in the reality or in the virtual world, and most people always thought the virtual world is a digital world. But somehow these boundaries, they don't really exist anymore. I mean, we all experience the lockdown, the COVID crisis, and uh, live most of our life or a lot of our lives also through digital systems, also in our digital interact in our social interaction with people. And I think we've passed that, that moment in our lives where you would say, is that a digital get-together with somebody feels less real than a physical one. So it seems more applicable these days to talk maybe about the physical and the digital, but not the real and the unreal. Reality applies to both. And I think, Luisa, reality is a big 
factor or topic in your, in your work and it would be nice if you could tell us a bit more about your work and what reality somehow means to you. Um, yeah, as you said, um, I think we are now on the border of a kind of on life. So um, there is nothing you can really say. For example, um, yeah, you are just offline or on just online. This is something completely melting into each other. And um, for me um, and for my work, the quite interesting to figure out what is then real and what is not real when we um, talk to people, we meet people online, but not in real world. I mean, there are, for example, contacts we have, we never seen before or we will never see at the end, but we have the connection to them in some kind of em embodiment places. And this is something I think is, um, yeah, something I'm questioning always is the, um, how to deal with that when you are like not in this space, but but in this space at the same time. And how do you? Louder. I do my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. Yeah, and for me, I um, try to figure out what is um, real or authentic in in a complete real and unreal world at the same time. And um, I think the focus of my work is actually how we live together and how we interact with each other and also with our person. And yeah. And uh, I'm questioning the changes which are now going on or where, where we are in at the moment. There's a big um, time of changes for all of us, I guess. I think we can right now see um, Luisa's work on the screens to the left and the right. That's the solo that, that uh, Kunst and Denka Contemporary is showing um, at the fair. Um, can you maybe tell us a bit more about yeah, what we are seeing? Uh, yes, um, so our concept for the booth was um, actually a new piece I did uh, in the beginning of the year, um, Compression, which is a really, really small sculpture. Um, in the sculpture is a synthetic DNA, which is the storage of my whole work from the last 10 years. So 400 pieces um, were really on a synthetic DNA strung. And um, as this is a kind of archive for me and um, also my storage, we um, developed a booth um, with yeah pieces showing the last 10 years, actually. So from the series of heads, you can see on the on the, more upper on the booth, um, this was my exam at the um, Academy in Düsseldorf, and um, where I also started to uh, where I also start work working with the body and with the question on of uh, yeah individually and how we um, deal in as an individual in this whole gray group of people or also on the internet. And from there on, it's developed into um, the question how we yeah, deal with each other also as avatars um, or in the real world. Most of the pieces you see here are based on the questions how you deal um, or how you meet people in um, the digital world or um, um, as, a, as a second um, thing, was uh, this or uh, at the second center was the um, an avatar I made by myself um, two years ago, um, and I bought him in the real world again as a uh, robotic PPA doll, which is um, yeah based on my personality and also based on how I look like and um, yeah and for example the hands are the hands of the robotic doll.
So, so basically, your work and also the question of reality focuses a lot also on your, let's say, own physical and digital identity and, and the overlap. And it's also not a um, surprise that you chose the DNA technology to store all your works. No, actually not, because it makes sense, because it, I'm always yeah, trying to question the body and um, try to go further and further with this. And this was actually, a, for me, in the end, a quite logical step um, to come... Yeah, to combine this whole question with the biotechnical um, developments we are also in at the moment. Oh, thank you, thank you, Luisa. Um, David, um, as part of your nostalgia project that we can see here at the fair at Jean Conta Gautier, um, you erased 10,000 of photographs from your personal archive, and in the process, you selected a group of those photographs and described them individually in short text before finally erasing them. Can you tell us a bit more about that project and the motivation behind erasing and then at the same time memorizing us images? Yeah, so um, I have to speak against or with the rain, um, be like a little duet. Um, so the, which I think, are we gonna go to the next, the next slide? Um, if you want. Maybe if we could, could um, show the, the second slide of the presentation on the screen. And then delete it after. So the project is, um, a lot of my projects are kind of iterations of iterations and they kind of have their own lives and kind of um, like generate like new projects in themselves. And the original project was called Nostalgia. And that was uh, a project that I developed as a way of um, thinking about this kind of personal archive that everyone, probably everyone in this room has. Like if you look at your phone and you look at how many images are on your phone and you know, there could be like 10,000, 5,000. And like for me, it's like, how do you grapple with this like, this very abstract idea of this like kind of over inundation, this like flooding of images that we just carry around with us of our lives and like kind of document moments like almost every day every second like things like like things that you you think you might want to look at again like this tiramisu with the espresso and a spoon and then your friend because they look good in the light and then your friend five minutes later and then your friend five minutes later so like we, we live with like these images that we carry with us and um for nostalgia i was trying to think of this opposite of like with photography you like make photography but like what would be the reverse of that to like unmake photography or to destroy photography. And so for the project, I wanted to erase the images, but not just erase them immediately and like simply just press and delete. Um, they were originally projected and each image gets projected for one minute. And so let's say there's an exhibition somewhere and the exhibition is up for like, let's say two months and it's open Thursday to Saturday, 11 to four on some days, 10.30 to 5.30 on other days, I would calculate how many minutes an actual exhibition would be open. And then on my phone, on my, on my digital archives, on hard drives, on my laptop, I would find that amount of photographs, um, that I've, my own photographs. So it could be like 40,000, it could be like 15,000. And then I would collect them and then they would get projected each one for one minute. And so it's as if like this moment that we experienced once, or maybe you could even argue that we didn't even experience it because we photographed it and by photographing it, we negated the experience of it. But we could just say this moment can come back to life for like one more moment. And so they're projected for one minute as this kind of like very meditative slideshow and then they're erased. And after I did that, I make a lot of artist books and there were some of the images that I would watch as they would get erased. And I would, um, I will speak louder against the rain. I'm trying to be shut out by the climate. Um, and I would, um, in a very, I like to think of, think of like the idea of a haiku, even though it's structurally not a haiku. They're just single sentences that describe the photograph that I deleted, which contains the, um, if you look down, it's like the image file and the time and date stamp. I could be louder. 
Um, Let's hope it's not a bad omen for digital art, huh? Yeah, yeah. We're trying. We're, this is the flood. This is the flood of images, right now. <laughs> um, and so they were. So, so the artist book, which there's now three versions of them, contain these like moments, and some are very personal, um, like my daughter, um, the shadow of my daughter, and some are money. It's like a photograph of a dollar bill. It's just titled money. And so now these images no longer exist. So the files are gone. Um, but now there's these like kind of like, it, you could maybe say memory, traces, fragments. Um, I was having a conversation with someone earlier in the booth and we were talking about this idea how you would have a very personal memory of something, of like a photograph, but no one else would because they would just see that photograph. But what I did was I deleted the photograph but kept the memory. So you, know, you have like the context. But not the thing of like, this is crazy. <laughs> crazy. I, I don't know. Somebody is not happy with us yeah. doing this. Um, yeah. <laughs> they were like, get this guy out of the photo fair. Yeah. Maybe we should all move the over images. to the sector and do a tour instead. I'm not, I'm not sure. But, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and, so, and so what we have now is this text and the yeah. memories. And that's what we're left with. And, and that's what's presented. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, I was always intrigued by David's work, and we also worked together a couple of years ago already, but when I thought about the fair and the, let's say, average art lover, photography lover, thinking about the digital and the art, most people would come to such a new sector, and I guess they would expect many screens or digital devices on which you would find the images. And I felt so intrigued by somehow reverting this and showing something that it's in the end of the day, very analog, but started somewhere with a completely different intention, which is very much related to our digital daily life because we are all overwhelmed by the multitude of images we have to deal with. And it's also problematic in the meantime um, on many levels. And for me, this whole topic for the arts or this whole theme is also about artists talking with new media about new media or kind of reflecting reflecting and discussing in their work about what's going on in our society for the individual as a society as a total in totality um, in this digital process and it's super important because artists have a different voice let's say than politicians lawyers or business people and we need these voices in our society to explain things to to also get different lights on, on certain aspects and um, I think we, will see, we see that also in your work, we see that in many works that are presented here at Paris Photo. So uh, art in the digital age is not only about new media or somebody working with digital means, it's also about reflecting I'd say on digitalization and things can manifest themselves in very different ways and um, something that happens um, now, also in the context of the digitalization is, um, and that fascinates me a lot, is that the definition of long-term established art genres in the analog world, they're also sudden they're being challenged, or at least we, we, we should maybe think them anew or rethink them in certain ways. And uh, Marco, we had several discussions about that, um, the notion of the post-medium and um, the importance of traditional photography also in this context, which I think also somehow brings us here. And what's your perspective on the role of the medium in the digital age? I was thinking about something completely different, but... <laughs> <laughs> hey, go ahead, we can also come to that later. I'll, I'll reply to that. But I thought, isn't it interesting that this thing of nostalgia, like this thing of memory, like photography was really the medium for memory. And it kind of became the medium for Instagramming your lunch. And, and then now it's becoming the medium of predicting an image that is like this statistical prediction of the future somehow. Just something about the temporal shift of the, like the image somehow that, that went there. So just something I was thinking about <laughs> and I, <laughs> I wanted to share. But um, no, I think that still the, the idea of, of uh, post-medium is something that came... Maybe, maybe, maybe David wants to quickly want to respond to that first or... Yeah, okay. Uh, this, this idea of post-media, I think that came very strongly in the 90s with digitalization. I think also the term digitalization versus like digital born things um, happening in a moment in which 
you know, this, also this concept of remediation, the new medium that incorporates uh, the old one, right? Like a cinema incorporating theater and then digital media incorporating the previous one. Um, I do think that there's like very much a specificity of photography uh, that is retained in new technologies, that not everything is just data. Of course, we can analyze things as just being data and there's an important shift at that level, but I do think that the medium of photography, not in a technical sense, but maybe more in like a social political sense is very much the reason or like the, the trajectory that helps creating many of these different forms. Like I'm thinking, you know, um, attention economy, platform capitalism, surveillance uh, capitalism, all of these things, if you think about it, have the image at its center, right? Um, all of the ways in which the, the image becomes networked, uh, you know, the, it not, of course, uh, technically a photograph, but they could not exist without photography and the way of looking through photography and its tradition. So I do think that there's like a, a medium specificity of digital images, digital imaging um, in all of its different, in different forms. But at the same time, of course, there are like specific properties that make them different from um, its analog counterpart. But I, I guess that's always also the question, where do you draw the line, right? Like where, where you can decide to look at it as a photographic tradition and where you want to focus on the specificity of the change. I think we are indeed living in a, in a time where we can say that um, everything that belongs in that context of art and photography in the digital is, um, can start or take any form between the digital and the physical. So things can start very digital, they can manifest and as an artwork where in a very physical way somewhere in a gallery booth or in a gallery, but it could also be the other way around. Something could also start very physical like, like a scan from a painting or something you see in a newspaper and it could be transformed in something very digital that in the end that you find on a screen and, um, and everything in between. So there are really no, let's say, clearly defined borders anymore also to these genres and we also see, I feel, a clear overlap into between the different practices. So we, we let's say, um, in, typically when we talk painting, people feel like, Painting is done with a canvas and paint, but newly painting can also be done on your laptop. And um, if the painting is then, let's say, inspired by also by photography, then we might also find it here and say it belongs in that context of photography in the in the digital age. So, um, David, in, in your case, um, maybe back to that we are only um, seeing text. I think what's even what, what's even more intriguing than these, these memories, the leftovers of the images, to me is uh, the way you are defining for the collector or also the gallery showing this, um, the freedom that you give to people. Um, I, today I looked through the, through the presentation by the gallery and I found the following. The sentences are the caption of photographs that no longer exist. The sentences can be installed with any technique the sentences can be installed with any font. The sentences can be installed at any size. They are unique and come with a certificate. I mean, I guess that's also not uh, random. So there must be a certain motivation behind that. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I mean, that? maybe it's just me um, taking myself away from any responsibility and you, and you um, materializing the work. No, I mean, it's, it's for me, it's also a way for, you know, it's a protocol, it's a tr certificate. I mean, obviously there is a tradition. It, you know, it sounds like a Lawrence Wiener text, um, but it's like a way for you um, to produce the work. I mean, and, and, and we're talking in terms of like art collecting and you could, and someone who, could, who buys it and they own a certificate, whereas like anyone could just take the protocol and just do it themselves. And it would be materially the same thing. Um, you just wouldn't have a certificate, but I can make you one. I can make you a fake one. Um, but even like in the, um, in like the book, um, they're all like, you know, their design and their type. And, and it's like, it's just these ways for the text itself to, to kind of mutate and transform into different contexts. I mean, it also involves the collector somehow gives the collector a certain saying in your in your work, at least in the way it's being presented at the end. If you decide to make use of the certificate or the right to to somehow apply it 
on a wall or put it on a screen. Yeah. So, I mean, it's something that's also would have been difficult maybe to imagine in a pre-digital world. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but, like, it's also a way to, like, for me, it's, it's a way also to keep me from having to make a final decision. It's also, like, some of these works are very, like, conceptual, but when I think about them, it's, like, very idiosyncratic to me. I was like, oh, yeah, I can't. I'm incapable of, like, coming to a final. There's, like, works that I was talking with Michael about this the other day. I have works that are 20 years old almost, and I still don't know how to display them. And so it's a way to, like, to put that onto someone else or to give someone some kind of agency um, into the production and, and almost, in a sense, a kind of collaboration into how the work gets finally produced or realized. And, yes. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, another topic that might be interesting is um, the fact that we are an art fair, at an art fair, a very physical event. We are all here with our physical bodies. And at the same time, we're presenting something that at least in its title says digital. And um, I think that's also something that often comes up when people think about art in the digital context. Why do we need a physical space? to display digital art, and I think we've seen your work, we've seen Davis, David's work that makes already, gives us certain ideas why we might need that, but I think, Luisa, you also have a very specific opinion on why we, let's say, for our physical bodies, do need this space where we kind of get together and, and, and share things also in, in, in a physical way. Um, yeah, I still believe that our mind and our soul is um, connected to our body and um, as it is as we all feel every day that we are like have a body and that also all our feelings, our also our memories are connected to our body and to our body reaction. And I think this is actually the part um, and also the power we have um, is empathy and emotional feelings and this is something which can never be given by um, the digital world or the IA which is nowadays a big topic um, as it is when you really feel it in in your body and so um, and this is uh, actually a point where I still believe that the body and therefore also art needs to be also in a real context and you have to see art stand in front of it and understand what's what is there what you really see you can't see all the pieces you see here on instagram and think you have seen them you know because you don't have the connection to the body marco i mean you're working as a curator for a museum and you've been doing exhibitions where you were bringing let's say digital art into the museum for, for many years. So what's your perspective on that? I think uh, at Photo Museum throughout the years, we've done a lot of different experiments as well with different online spaces and physical spaces. So I really enjoy the specificity of both. I think that more institutions should experiment with online spaces, um, you know, like uh, extending the space of the museum in uh, online platform that can host uh, different works. Uh, I still really enjoy exhibition spaces. Um, also, you know, in terms of, of uh, the, the spatial experience, the social component, they all have somehow the, their properties. And I think museums, I'm, I'm talking about museum because that's my, my expertise, but I think gallery probably could be the same, should um, and are experimenting with, with both spaces, right? That there is like a, some things that, you know, when you talk about Instagram and, and um, um, looking at a work uh, via Instagram, I don't think it's less real uh, than seeing a work in the physical space. And for one work would actually make more sense to experience it via Instagram. For another work would make sense to experience it in the physical space. And then if we want to talk about the, the art fair and the collector, since we're here, I think the last uh, um, UBS report that our puzzle was saying that more than what? 10% of sales are done via Instagram. So maybe the real, you know, like I think that we have to think a little bit what you mean with, uh, what we mean with the uh, real and the implications of it. But that's not my topic. 
I think it's definitely um, a challenge for, for artists, but also for people who work with artists, curators, galleries, to find the right, let's say, form and fashion for every single artwork to be presented. I mean, uh, if we imagine a digital sculpture, so a sculpture that was never made with physical material in the first place, but was created in a, in a digital environment, in the computer, for example. And these sculptures have a completely different behavior or identity than um, the typical physical sculpture that would sit on a pedestal or would sit on the ground, might be made of wood or metal. And um, it might float, it might turn, it might have sound, visual effects. And it's very difficult to bring these works in an adequate way to a fair. I mean, if you put it on a screen, you, you, you see somehow that it has a digital nature and it can turn and you can see the sound, how this hears the sound, the visual effects. But at the same time, something is not right because it's not a three dimensional experience. And after all, for example, sculptural works usually are three dimensional. They are, they are objects, they have an object character. And um, they are more and more appropriate forms of experiencing these works like augmented reality, virtual reality and I think um, it's really like um, some of our duties or things we need to, to ensure going forward when exhibiting uh, digital art is really to find the right way of, of displaying each piece and making enable people to, exp to experience it and um, that also takes a bit like a give and take between the audience and the people organizing the exhibition because it's also a learning process. A lot of these things is still, are still pioneer work. We see that now with that latest generation of artists working in the digital who started um, with, let's say, the blockchain and NFTs in 2021. For most of these people, even here at the fair, might be the first time that they are hanging a piece on a wall. So we had several very interesting discussions about how to do these things. And Marco, I think we also discussed that it takes a certain advocacy or like, like um, education also about the, the digital world and the social phenomena that are attached to it in general to appreciate digital art. So I think that's also um, an, an interesting topic because maybe still a lot of people struggle to, to kind of warm up to this new field. And so maybe to all of you, what do you think, what does it take to appreciate art in that context? Yeah, well, I think it's um, still difficult to say because as you said, we, we are in the beginning of something which we have to still find out. And I think the, yeah, there are several pieces, of course, just working in the internet or online or in at the computer and some are not um and this cross we um trying to figure out how to deal with it and um i think at the moment there are many possibilities in this whole um way we are going through we don't even um know yet what uh, what all can happen and this is actually a great chance to have those kind of pieces also here on the fair and also um, see how it develops right now. Do you see a new collector group for your work, for example, like a younger group of people who look at your work um, online and decide to buy? Pretty sure um, that is possible, yes, of course. I try to avoid collectors. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You think it's the job of the gallery? Talk to the gallery. Good. Marco? I have no problems with collectors, but... That, that's, that's very refreshing. Are you fundraising? <laughs> but what do you think, what does it take to appreciate or fall in love with art and the digital? No, I think, I mean, jokes aside, again, uh, speaking from the side of the institution, um, I think for institutions like museums of photography, it's important also to collect um, artworks that might uh, be digital born and in forms that are difficult or different from uh, the traditions and the canon. So recently we acquired like a Instagram channel, for example, um, and not waiting for, you know, blockchain or anything. I think that small scale 
uh, approaches to collecting and preserving are much more valuable um, because otherwise if you're always waiting for these standards to apply to the digital world you will never start collecting you never start acquiring for the collection so you know um, we did like we use web recorder we made like um, video screen grabs screenshot of everything so already you can get uh, some preservation tools and writing about the work uh, um, for institutions that are accessible to every size of institution. So I think the effort should be there in the first place to start investigating and preserving and uh, uh, acquiring these works, regardless of this, uh, this form. I think that maybe, you know, people often talk about the digital maybe in relation with uh, performance art or more, um, yeah, performative forms of artwork. So there are many ways in which these uh, uh, works can can be collected without having to put them in this like um, you know category of like very technical or technological, very specific. I think what what is required is more like the the, the intention maybe. So so nostalgia here, as I described earlier, um, is also a slideshow. And that work is also available for acquisition. And the way you would, the way it would, it sold is, I would give you a hard drive, and that when you look at the images for one minute, you delay, you would erase them, so that you would have, let's say, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand images, and then over time, once you look at them, you have to destroy them. So it would be a work that slowly kind of um, becomes nothing. But it's also like a, a kind of a trust with the person who would buy it or acquire, or the institution who would acquire it, which I assume someone would acquire it because they would they you know engage in this kind of conceptual project so basically uh, you would only want this this work in the hands of a collector who would then also follow the process and and let yeah, it pass yeah. by basically yeah and there i mean there is a a, a frac in paris who who owns who owns one um and so they have a hard drive of 20,000 images or or whatever the number was and when they choose to exhibit the work that will that will decrease. I mean, maybe they just show one image for one minute of it. Yeah. And they have 19,000 still. So, or maybe they, you know, in the end they have an empty hard drive and then that gets hung on the wall. But in, in that case, if you, let's say the images are passing by, you have them for one minute, they disappear. Are they also being replaced with anything or do they just vanish? I mean, they just, I mean, they they just vanish. I mean, they you know maybe they're replaced with some memory you have. I always like to think of the exhibition when the projection is going. Um, there is the moments when no one's there, and it's like the saddest thing. It's like the images that no one sees. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit like like social media. Huh? They are also, in a way, thousands of images every day. I guess that nobody takes care of, which which is also a, a topic. Um, all of these things that we experience uh, experiencing they are very often driven by algorithms which are not even in any way transparent to us and uh, it's also a scary part of i mean this overload of images that we are facing that that some companies some people are steering what we are even seeing or perceiving in our daily life so um yeah I would say we are anything you would like to add to discussion. Then I would say that we open up for questions from the audience, and um, it's nice that we have a lot of time for that until the next panel. So we can ask you questions too. Hello. I would just like to say to Marco that uh, I can't understand why you see uh, no difference between Instagram and seeing an opus. The great difference is scale. That's all. So what do you make of scale? Because Instagram is a very small screen. <laughs> sure. So... Uh... 
Oh, just to clarify, of course, I totally agree. What you like, an image that you see on a screen on a social media platform is different from uh, an object that you see in a physical space. Um, but what I'm saying is that if we start thinking about the term reality, uh, the reality that is offered through Instagram is very much uh, as dominant, if not even more, than the experience in the physical space. Um, that's why I was making the connection to the fact that actual sales of works are made through Instagram in. Uh, over the years, more and more percentage. Then, of course, um, from a phenomenological point of view, I completely agree with you. I'm not saying that uh, the experience of the world through a phone is exactly the same of experience in the world uh, through our eyes. Yes. Do you have an Instagram? No? Okay. <laughs> Who here doesn't have an Instagram? <laughs> One, two. Two, okay. Three, four. I think everybody's on Twitter these days. <laughs> What's Twitter? X? So any, any more questions? Can you explain what is DNA technology? Could you explain what is DNA technology and synthetic photography? That's for you, Louisa. Um, yeah, the DNA technology that I used is um, actually um, yeah, based on the idea of, um, yeah, we do big, big storages into really small places because all the storages we have, for example, for Google, Meter, and so on, they all have like really storage villages. And so, um, Every, there are companies trying to figure out how to storage um, data in really small places for long term. And this is one of these um, techniques to storage into DNA, actually in the chemical um, parts. And you can transform JPEGs, for example, or even text uh, into these chemical. Um, yeah, the chemical um, worms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think in, in Luisa's case makes even most sense because as we've seen, uh, most of the work, a lot of your work circles around the, the body. Yeah. And nothing is closer, let's say, to our bodies than our DNA. So, I mean, it makes most sense to use such a technology than also to store your own work about the body in a DNA and it's one of the most advanced technologies these days for storing um, data. It, it feels a bit abstract. It's not that easy to, to, to imagine. And when you look at this very little capsule that's sitting on that pedestal under a piece of glass to, so that nobody takes it, <laughs> takes it away, it's, 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 it's really, really impressive. So I recommend going there and looking at um, this DNA storage device. Looks like a little metal capsule, basically. But it's it's a whole life on it, huh? artistic life, basically. E exactly. Yeah. Somebody else. Duncan. Okay, in that right, case, right, we, got oh. we got one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, whoa, that was very loud. Um, this is a question specifically to David, because you just looked at me. Um, what is the relationship between writing down a description of these works for this project and uh, writing down alt text for like a um, accessibility purpose? There's some artists who are thinking a lot about describing images in alt text as a form of poetry. Um, there's an alt text as poetry workshop that um, Shan and Finnegan runs in New York. But um, yeah, can you talk about that? Um, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I've, I've thought about that only recently because um, I've never actually used alt text that much. Um, and sometimes some of my friends give me crap, like DK. Um, but so I haven't really thought about it a lot. Um, 
but it's something I I I am interested to like like dive into. Mike because this does some of the work of that, but not all of the work of that, but it does something else at the same time. There's yeah. some surplus. Yeah, I mean there's I mean less about like the sur it's like there's more of like I don't want to say the artist intention. I mean, because the because like in the alt text, it could also include like, what did you mean by that? Like when you made that that photograph, or like just all these other things. Does um, does everybody know what an alt text is? Maybe we need to quickly quickly explain that. Alt text is the image description that is uh, on the on a website that shows up if you hover over the image. And it's used for um, accessibility purposes, in particular for um, readers, uh, blind, uh, blind readers of websites. I mean, in a sense, my alt text should be an alt image <laughs> for this. <laughs> Sorry. Um. <laughs> Inside a joke. No, but no, but this is like this is something I've been like I haven't like fully like thought about a lot, but it's something. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean they are the they are the text, you know. I think we have another question here in the middle. It's it's not a question, but alt text is alternative text. When the website doesn't load the image, you have text that you can read what the image is until it downloads. It's alternative text. It's not really meant. Uh, yeah, it's or, really or, just yeah. meant to uh, tell you what the image is. It's supposed to show. That's that's what alt text. Is. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, we Other? got one. <laughs> Hi. Sorry. Hello. Uh, I would have a question for Marco. I don't know if I understand properly. You said that uh, you have acquired uh, an Instagram page or an Instagram account. Did I understand it properly or not? That we um, acquired a project that is an Instagram channel in the collection of Photo Museum. Yes. Okay. And uh, how can we access that? And uh, how does it work, in fact? Just a curiosity. So more specifically, this is the, the channel is called Insta Repeat by Emma Sheffer, uh, who's Ameri an American artist. And actually, the channel is public, so you can access it on Instagram. On the online collection of the museum, you can find like screenshots of it. And then we have, at the moment, a uh, contextualization that is yet to go public, but some writing that go along with it. Um, the idea about this is, of course, thinking in terms of long-term ones the platform of Instagram does not exist anymore, and it goes down. Um, you're smiling, you're happy. So, <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, of course, if, if we think back of also, you know, uh, I mentioned Flickr. Uh, now, you know, when we talk about Flickr, it sounds like a history, right? And it's barely alive. It kind of like almost died and it was resurrected, right? Um, so this, this uh, idea, of course, uh, for a photography museum are, are very important in the moment that we go and uh, um, try to preserve a work like that. Of course, the preservation will always be at the best of uh, uh, what's possible. There's also, uh, I mentioned, uh, a tool called Web Recorder that was initially created by Rhizome in New York, which is available for everybody to create an offline record of an online uh, page or set of pages. Marco, now I'm curious, can you shed some light on what the artist does in that account? What sure. made it so interesting for the museum to collect it? Yeah, thanks, actually. Um, and uh, I invite you all to go and check the page of Insta Repeat. But basically, what Emma Sheffer does, is she looks at all the influencers, especially travel influencer images, and she looks for similarities. And then she finds out that the same spot is used by all the travel influencers. It's the same bridge over and over and over. It's the same pose. It's the same uh, girl with a hat on a canoe. And then she creates this grid uh, of these uh, similar images tagging the original creators. And that account is just like one um, trope after the other. So he kind of created like a, a taxonomy, a vocabulary, a glossary of uh, influencer uh, photography aesthetic, of travel influencer photography aesthetic, which 
uh, my belief, and I hope the belief uh, of Photomuseum Winterthur, is uh, the fact that uh, this is a pivotal moment in the history of photography, the rise of influencer images, influencer photography as a new aesthetic, as an aesthetic that comes, of course, from advertisement and specific semiotics, but goes and changes the logic of image sharing. So these images are very real. I come back to this uh, thing of the real and go and affect the way that we think of photography through photography, through images, and uh, how we are influenced by that. Bam. I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> Thank you. Did I open it? So, final question, now that the rain is over and everything looking good again. Who here owns an NFT? <laughs> good question. <laughs> but it's not the same people. <laughs> so um, thank, thank you all for coming here today. Um, this panel will be followed by a second panel um, that's um, under the lead of Charlotte Kent. I don't know if Charlotte is already here. Um, and this panel will be about uh, conceptual and synthetic photography in the context of AI and the artist Kevin Abosch. Anna Riddler and Sophia Crespo will join Charlotte for that talk. I think it starts at five in approximately 30 minutes. And yeah, you're all kindly invited to visit us at the digital sector and we will gladly give you a tour. So thanks for coming. Thanks to all of you.